we're in the second part of our series called Believe Like Jesus, where we're asking the question, what would our faith look like if we believed what Jesus believed? Uh, notice the question is, what would our faith look like? It's not what would our faith sound like? What would we say about our faith? What would our faith read like? What would we write about our faith? But what would our faith look like if we believed what Jesus believed? Because I believe that if we believe what Jesus believes, our lives look radically different. And today I want to talk about grace is a two-way street. And the great thing today, being back in church, is that we're trying something for the first. I, first time, I love firsts. But this Sunday, 11 o'clock service is the first time that I am speaking to our congregations in Chesterfield, in Derby, and in Sheffield, all at the same time. We're all in the same room, people. So come on, why don't you welcome each other? Give it up, give them a cheer. It's so good to be speaking to the whole church, and we're going to do this more and more. Now, we've, you know, we've invested a little bit in making sure the technology works, and we've tested it, etc., and so it's such a great thing to do, and this will allow us to continue to expand and start more locations and also to keep that sense of us being one church in many places, which we want to do. I believe through this message, God will speak to us today. We've already had a powerful service this morning, and uh, I believe God's going to speak to us. So I'm going to pray and just commit this time to God, and then we're going to get into God's Word. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that we can gather as Christian Life Church this morning in three locations, and we can all be one in Christ Jesus, and we can be one church here in your Word. We commit these moments, this time to you. We ask you to speak to us, to transform us, to change our thinking and to change our hearts. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I want to start with a verse from John's Gospel. John chapter 1 and verse 16. <clears throat> just to get us going this morning. And uh, it's a great verse. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation version of the Bible. And it says this. It says, From the abundance... From his abundance, we have all received one gracious blessing after another. Another translation, a translation I personally love, says this. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received grace upon grace. I mean, John stops there when he just says grace upon grace. But he could carry on when he says from his abundance or from the fullness of his grace, we have all received grace upon grace, upon grace. I love that verse because it tells us there's no shortage of supply of grace. There's no shortage in God. It says from his abundance, from his fullness, the fullness of Jesus, we have all received grace, upon grace, upon grace, upon grace. I'm so excited about that verse. That God is an abundant God. He's a full God. He's not going to run out of grace for you and for me. He's not going to run out of grace for people in Chesterfield, in Derby, in Sheffield. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received grace upon grace upon grace. What do you think of when you think of the word grace? What does the word grace mean to you? If we take the uses of the word in the New Testament... We can come up with a definition, and I've come up with this definition, and it'll, you'll see it on the screen, that grace is the gift of free and undeserved favor. Grace, the gift. I love a gift, don't you? I love a free gift, one that comes with no conditions, but it's a free gift, the gift of free and undeserved favor. I, have you ever noticed how hard, though, it can be to receive grace? You know, this message is about grace being a two-way street, and that's simply that we have to receive grace and we have to give grace. But you know, it can be hard to receive grace. This voice talks about from God's fullness, actually from the fullness of Jesus, we have all received one blessing after another, or grace upon grace upon grace, or we have received free and undeserved favor upon free and undeserved favor upon free and undeserved favor. But it can be hard, it can be hard to receive it. I, I, it happened to me this week that grace, favor was hard to receive. As you know, I've been in Spain for 10 days with Jeannie and 
some of our family. The first three days, we were at a conference in Malaga, and Jeannie and I were both speaking, and Nathan also was involved in doing some facilitation in some of the sessions. But, so we were at a conference for three days, and then we were going to have six days holiday, Jeannie and I, six days holiday, and then one day working for ground level, because a couple of ground level pastors have just gone out in Spain and started a church, or take, taken over, sorry, a church in Spain, and so we met them for a day just to work with them. So three days at a conference, six days holiday, one day working for ground level. At this conference, after this conference, we had to get back to the airport to pick up our hire cars so that we could then go and have our holiday. And the, the conference was in Malaga. Juanito Johnson, our great friend, and Ulrika were at the conference in Mal Malaga. And Juanito came to me at the end of the conference and he says, Paul, I want to bless you. He says, I am going to send tomorrow morning, Saturday morning, a driver, and they will pick you up. So limousine style, they will pick you up, and they will take you to the airport where you can pick up your hire cars. I said, Juanito, don't bother. I said, you know, our hotel, we planned this whole trip, our hotel lobby. Actually, you walk out of our hotel lobby, and you're in the train station, and it's a 10-minute train journey back to the airport. And then we can take our bags and walk to where we pick up the car. He says, no, but Paula, I want to bless you. And I said, Juanito, why, why would you bother sending a driver? He has got to drive 30 minutes to our hotel, and then he's going to take us to the airport, which is 10 minutes by train. He says, I want to do it, Paul. I want to bless you. And I'm finding it difficult. I said, no, Juanito, I don't think you're listening to me. I, I can walk out of my hotel into the train station, catch a train, and come every 20 minutes. It takes 10 minutes on the train. I'm at the airport. I get out the, there. I get to the high. He says, I know. He says, I know, but I want to send a driver to take you to the airport. I said, Juanito, it's crazy. It has to come 30 minutes. And it's going back and forth like this. At this point, another one of my friends, former friends, another one of my friends butts in and he says, Paul, he's trying to bless you. He's trying to bless. I say, I know he's trying to bless you, bless me. But I can walk out of my hotel, in, and he says, Paul, if you don't let him bless you, you're keeping him small. Now he shouldn't have said that because at that point I said, right, let me tell you what I want to do. I want to keep him small, and I want you to butt out. <laughs> I realized I was finding it hard to receive grace. And so I said, Juanito, I said, that's so generous of you. We'll take the lift. And so the chauffeur arrived in the morning and took us to the airport where we picked up our car. It can be hard to receive grace. Grace can also be hard to give, can't it? We've all got that person. Those people, they rub us up the wrong way. Somebody who's always annoying or frustrating. Somebody who sometimes maybe we try and see the good in them, but all we see is their faults. It can be somebody that's hurt us, somebody who was once a friend or something. And we just find it hard to give grace, a gift, a free, undeserved favor can be hard to give. You know, this message is called Grace is a Two-Way Street. It's about receiving grace from God, but being able to, to give grace to other people. And I believe that Jesus believed in grace this way, that we were to receive the grace of God, but we were also not just to receive it and enjoy it ourselves, but we were to give grace and favor to other people. But I think that Jesus really believed is this, that you have to be able to receive it in order to give it, that you've got to be able to receive it in order to give it. And maybe it can be impossible to truly give grace unless we can truly receive it. You have to receive grace to be able to give grace. The verse we read talks about how from his fullness, from his abundance, we've all received. There's not a short supply, but we've all received grace upon grace upon grace. But I think sometimes we think that grace comes with conditions. We think that God loves us. We think that God shows favor to us, but it comes with conditions. We think that grace comes if, with conditions. We think that grace comes with caveats, with <clears throat> little small print maybe written into the agreement of receiving God's grace. We think of gr it's grace, but, or grace if. 
And I think it matters for us to be able to see that that's not true and that we need to receive God's gift of free. We all love a freebie, don't we? God's gift of free and undeserved favor. This matters because we all need grace. We all need the gift of free and undeserved favor. I know if I didn't have grace as a gift, as a free, undeserved favor, I would never be able to earn it. I would never be able to earn God's love, God's grace, God's mercy in my life. I could never earn it. So I need it. We all need it. This gift of free and undeserved grace and favor. Imagine if we could fully receive this abundant grace, this full grace. Imagine if we could really, truly receive the fullness of it, the abundance of it. I believe that we'd be free from guilt. I believe that we could live free from shame. I believe that sometimes the baggage we carry around that life has given to us would not hamper us like sometimes it does because we can receive the abundance of God's grace. I believe it matters that you and I can receive God's full, free, abundant grace today. I also think this matters because people are going to experience God's grace through us. You know, what if we could receive this grace so abundant, so free, so fully, and then we could give it, that we could give to others free, undeserved favor. We could give to others free, undeserved love. We could give to others free, undeserved hope. I believe that it matters because if we could receive it in its fullness, then we can give it. Grace is a two-way street. I think this matters because I think our world needs it more than ever. I think our world needs it more than ever, certainly in my lifetime, because I've never known our world so confused. So confused. So uh, confused about what's right and what's true and even things that are obvious. We're confused now as to whether a baby's a boy or a girl. We're so confused. I've never seen our world so fearful. There are things to fear in our world, but I personally in my lifetime have never seen our world so fearful, fearful of leaders, fearful of ideologies, fearful of things. We've never seen a world, I don't think, so stressed, so stressed out on stuff, on life. I don't think we've never seen a world like that. I don't think we've ever seen a world so disappointed. A world so disappointed, a people, a a generation, a people like us who have access to more stuff and more things than that we've wanted, but found that those things don't satisfy us like we thought they would. We've never seen a world so disappointed. I believe our world needs it because our world needs to experience something that surpasses their expectations. When so many things in our world are falling short of the expectations we have for them, our world needs to experience something that goes beyond expectations. So our world experiences or expects from grace, grace but, or grace if, or grace with. Grace with guilt, grace with condemnation, grace with fear. But I believe that we see today that God's grace is better than expected. And our world needs to experience something that surpasses expectations. If we can receive it, we'll be able to give it. And if only we can receive it, only when we receive it, are we able to give it. We need to receive grace and we need to give grace. Jesus experienced a situation with two people. One who could receive the free gift of God's undeserved favor and the other that couldn't. And in a moment, we're going to see the contrast in their lives and the responses. But before we go there, I want us to think about a story in John 8. We're not going to turn to it, but a story in John 8 where Jesus has just pulled an all-nighter on the Mount of Olives. He's uh, been all night on this mountain and he's been praying. Maybe all of the night, maybe most of the night, maybe he's done some outdoor sleeping. But in the morning, he walks the short distance from the Mount of Olives, down the Mount of Olives, over what's now a road. May have been a road in his day, but a dust road, and then up Mount Zion into the temple area. And as he gets into the temple area, he sits down and he begins to teach. And the religious leaders want to trap him. 
And to trap him, they bring a woman who's caught in adultery. This woman is probably naked. It's a blatant trap to try and get Jesus. And the religious leaders stand this woman in front of Jesus and they interrupt his teaching. And they ask him this question. They say this, Jesus, the law of Moses says that she should be stoned. What do you say? And Jesus is quiet, but he leans forward. He bends down and he begins to write in the dust, in the dirt. I wonder, have you ever wondered what he wrote? I wonder here in Chesterfield, in Derby, in Sheffield, Christian Life Church, have you ever wondered what he wrote in the dirt? You know, I've heard this passage preached on for over 40 years and, you know, people have speculated what Jesus wrote in the dirt. I've heard that some people speculate that Jesus wrote the sins of all the accusers. I've heard people, some people, preachers, take it so far that he actually wrote the names and the times and the dates. You know, like Jake Lloyd. <laughs> and then he spent a lot of time writing <laughs> names and places. I've heard that people speculate that. What was he writing? All we know when, when that Jesus is writing, and they con whatever he's writing, they continue to press him. They continue to say to him, Jesus, Jesus, answer us. The law of Moses says that she should be stoned. They were right. What do you say? And then Jesus says this, let the person with no sin cast the first stone. And then he continued to write. I wonder what was he writing? Was he writing condemnation? Was he writing judgment? Was he writing exposure of sins? Remember, they're referring to the law of Moses that God had written in the dirt 1,500 years earlier on another mountain. On Mount Sinai, Moses is meeting with God and God writes the law with his finger, the finger of God. But this day, the finger of God is writing again. It's on a different mountain, Mount Zion. And this day, the, the finger of God is not writing the tablets of stone. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. The finger of God is writing something different. I don't know if you've got the album Wonder by Hillsong United. This is not a commercial break, by the way, at the moment. But I don't know if you've got that album. But there's a song on that album called Splinters and Stones. I'd recommend you get the album. I, I love it. It's fantastic. And it tells the story of this woman, of this situation. And I want to read verse 2 to you. It'll come on the screen. Verse 2 goes like this. Grace, this is the woman. You saw the crushing weight my flesh deserved. You kneeled and wrote forgiveness in the dirt. 1,500 years earlier, God had given Moses the law. He'd wrote in tablets of stone. And then they'd expanded the law about how that those caught in adultery should be stoned. But God had written, thou shalt not commit adultery. But today, Jesus is writing in the dirt. And we don't know what he wrote, but I think this song has captured it. That this day, he wrote forgiveness in the dirt. What do you say? And as he writes, and as he says, let the one without sin cast the first stone, all her accusers walk away. And Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she replied. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Maybe he wrote in the dirt, forgiveness. Maybe he wrote in the dirt, 70 times 7. Maybe he wrote in the dirt, a new commandment I give to you, love one another. Maybe he wrote in the dirt, there is no condemnation. Whatever he wrote in the dirt that day, God was writing forgiveness in the dirt. And this woman received his grace, the fullness, the abundant grace that Jesus had. And then he could say, go and sin no more. Because that's the power of grace. When you and I receive it, when you and I can accept it, we can live differently and we can give grace to others. I'm excited today about the grace of God. But these two people, let's read about these two people in Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 36. It says this, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. 
A woman in that town who had lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him, she began to cry. And she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now that's weird. I mean, imagine you sitting in church today and a woman comes in. And if you're a guy, she takes off your shoes and socks and she begins to kiss your feet. Well, maybe you don't find it weird, but I find that very weird. Uh, maybe you're a lady here and you're wearing sandal, sandals uh, and, and they just slip off your sandals and start kissing your feet over it. Yeah, I know, it's weird. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him. He would know what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. So Jesus answered him, Simon, that was his name. I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. He's excited because that's why he invited him to learn from him. Tell me. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other just 50. Neither of them, though, had the money to pay him back. So he forgave both debts. Now, which of these loved him the most? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman. Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. She's still at it. She's still going. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you how many sin, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus says to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who's this that he even forgives sins? So Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. The woman comes in. I mean... Jesus is showing grace to both Simon and to the woman. He's a Pharisee, and he invites Jesus to dinner. And if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and some of the interaction that Jesus has with Pharisees, you know that he's showing grace to Simon by actually even turning up for dinner. Some of the things the Pharisees did to Jesus, some of the things that they tried to do to him, kill him on several occasions, but Jesus is showing grace to this religious leaders. And when you read that, it can come as a shock that he even accepted this invitation. He's showing grace to Simon. From the fullness of his grace, from the abundance of his grace, grace is being shown to Simon. But then there's this woman and she comes in. We know from the story, Simon calls her a sinful woman. And she begins to cry. She stood behind Jesus as Jesus reclines. And she begins to cry. Her tears fall on his feet. She's experiencing something she didn't expect. Something beyond her expectations. She's experiencing the presence of God. She's experiencing the presence of grace. You know, so many people say to me, they say it in all our locations, that we came to church for the first time and we cried all the way through the worship. Some people say to me, I cried all the way through your message. Because I'm a little bit of a joker, I want to say, was it that bad? You know, really? But here's what's happening, God's presence. They came experiencing a church service, but they met Jesus. And they met grace. And God's presence is touching our life. And she found grace that day. And we find grace in God's presence. We find that we are loved, that we are accepted, that we can be free. That our guilt and our shame does not have to define us forever. That actually there is forgiveness. That it's not great with, it's not great if, it's not grace but, but it's just grace given to us. Some people have even said to me that here in Chesterfield that, you know, when they've come through the doors and they've seen that welcome home sign, they've begun to cry. They can't believe, they didn't know why, they had no experience, but they just knew, they experienced something. It's the presence of God. It's the presence of grace and forgiveness and life and hope. She cried and her tears fell on his feet and she begins to wipe them with her 
hair and she kisses him over and over again. She pours perfume on his feet, the perfume of her trade. Her worship to grace, her response, sorry, to grace was worship. But Simon sees it all. He sees the impact that Jesus is having on the woman, the presence of God is having on this woman. He sees her transformation. He sees her extravagant worship, but he can't join in. He can't rejoice. He can't be glad. He can't praise God. He can't give grace. Maybe in Simon's thinking, there was no room for somebody to be that forgiven. Maybe in Simon's thinking, in his religious thinking, it meant that once you'd gone that far, there was no way back. I've met people like that. They've thought it's about themselves. They've thought, you know, I've gone so far. If only you knew about my past. They'd, they'd, I couldn't. It's grace, but there's all these caveats. They've thought it about themselves. They've thought it about others. Not being able to give grace, you know. And so Simon says, if he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is that she's a sinful woman. But you see, Jesus did not just see the woman. He didn't just see the woman and her experienced grace. He saw Simon. He saw Simon too. And he knew that Simon needed grace. That Simon needed to receive God's grace. So that he could change and be transformed from his religion to a person who could give grace. Have you ever asked the question, how did she get in? How did she get in? Maybe she was a regular at Simon's dinner parties. We don't know. But when was the last time when you were having people round to dinner that someone came in, seemingly uninvited, and started pouring perfume on your guests' feet and kissing them? Maybe she was a regular. Jesus in this moment wasn't just offering the woman grace. He had grace for Simon. He had grace for everyone. He saw Simon. He knew he needed grace. He knew that Simon needed a free gift of undeserved favor. He knew Simon needed to see grace in action. But Simon couldn't receive. And because he couldn't receive, he couldn't give. I believe this morning somebody's faith is going to get radically changed today. Somebody's faith is going to look a whole lot different from today. I believe like Jesus that there is grace, free undeserved, unearned favor, free, unearned forgiveness, free, unearned love, free, unearned freedom, free, unearned healing in this place today. Is anybody thankful for the grace of God today? Is anybody thankful for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? So Jesus asks Simon a question. He said, there's two, two people, one has a huge debt, one has a, a small debt, and both debts are canceled. Who loves the money lender the most? Simon knows it's the person who's been forgiven the huge debt. Jesus says, yes, you've got it right. In John chapter 8, Jesus, God, writes forgiveness in the dirt. In Simon's house, this woman encounters something she was not expecting. She encounters acceptance, value, hope, love forgiveness. She encounters the presence of God, the free gift of undeserved favor, the grace of God. And because she could receive it, Jesus says to her, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. Now go and sin no more. Because you've been able to receive this, you can go and live a different life. That's the power of grace. Because you've received it, you can go and give grace to others. That's how you radically receive God's grace. And that's how you radically give grace to other people. It's a two-way street. But first of all, you have to walk the way of receiving. You have to walk the way of receiving. You have to receive it. And you have to receive it fully. You can't receive grace but, grace if, grace with. You have to receive it as a free gift that cannot be earned. In all of our locations today, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. It's a free, unearned gift of grace. I don't know what you came 
to church like today, however you came. But I'm believing in this place today that you will experience what that woman did at that dinner party. That you will experience today, however you came, more than you were expecting. Maybe you thought you were just coming to a church service. You'd sing some songs, you'd hear somebody talk, but you've not come to a church service today. You have come into the presence of Jesus. You have come to into a place full, soaked with the presence of Jesus. And there is grace here. Free, unearned grace. Free, unearned hope. Free, unearned acceptance, value, love, and forgiveness. And you're going to experience it today, just like that woman. Maybe you've come today and you're not yet a follower of Jesus. But in somehow in this service, maybe in this talk, you've experienced him. It's God's grace, God's love, God's forgiveness towards you. You can become a follower of Jesus today in a few moments. Like we do in every service, we give people an opportunity. And we'll do that at the end of this service. But if you're here today, all you have to do is receive it. And if you can receive God's grace in your life, it can be released through you to others. And your life can be transformed. Maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for years. And maybe when you hear that verse in John chapter 1 verse 16, you rejoice from the fullness, the abundance of His grace. We all receive grace after grace after grace. If you've been following Jesus for years, you know that you didn't just need grace on day one. But you needed grace on day three. You know, maybe you did okay on day two, but day three you needed grace. And then four. And, and you know, you know if it was reliant upon your effort, you would stuff up so many times. That's why I'm so glad it's reliant upon Jesus. From the fullness, the abundance. Have you got it? Has anybody got that? The fullness. Has anybody in Derby got it? Anybody in Sheffield got it? From the fullness of his grace. We receive grace on grace on grace. You know why it's exciting? It means it's not going to run out. It means that grace is here for 2017, but it's also going to be here in 2018. It's not running out, people. God's love for you, God's forgiveness, God's acceptance, God's valuing of you. It is not running out. I thought somebody might get excited about that <coughs> this morning. Maybe you've followed Jesus for years and you do get excited about the fact that you receive grace upon grace upon grace. You just know you do. But you've struggled to give it. Maybe you've thought, like Simon, about certain people, that there's no room for grace there. They've gone so far. Maybe like me sometimes, you, you've looked at, at social media, people's lives on social media, and you've thought, Are they, they're doing What? They're making that choice. They're, they're, they're doing this. And, and you've not been able to give grace free, unearned, undeserved favor to people. I've, I've been there a lot. Usually at some point every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> it's a regular thing. But I believe if we can receive God's grace fully, freely, abundantly in our lives, we'll be able to give it to others. As I close, I want to read those <coughs> words from the song again, from verse 2 of Splinters and Stones, on the album Wonder by Hillsong United, by the way. No, I'm not on commission. Here it is. Grace, you saw the crushing weight my flesh deserved. You kneeled and wrote forgiveness in the dirt. And one by one the stones fell where they lay, as one by one my accusers walked away. With nothing left to throw, they made a cross. And knowing only love could count the cost, you were there. Grace, the gift of free and undeserved favor. Why don't we stand in all our locations as I pray this morning? And I'm going to pray this morning. And as you go into worship in all our locations, I'm believing that in that moment, you are going to experience something that that woman experienced. You're going to experience the love of God, the grace of God, the presence of Jesus in every place where we are speaking today. You're going to experience the grace and mercy and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for the free 
gift of undeserved favor upon our lives. I thank you today that wherever we are and wherever our lives are, there's nothing we can do to make you love us more. There's nothing we can add to your grace. It's not grace and, it's not grace with, it's not grace if. It's just the undeserved love and favor of God. And I pray, Father God, that for every person that's heard this message this morning, we will receive it like never before. We will receive it into our lives like never before. And we will give it like never before in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Come on, let's thank God for the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Fair.